Financial accounting is not the same as internal accounting with its detailed categories of all costs and sources of revenue. For the purposes of our discussion here, though, what is important is the odd way financial accounting treats employment costs as compared to other costs. Perhaps the best known example of this is investments in equipment are treated as assets that can be paid for and depreciated over time as we get value from them. But investments in employees are treated as a current expense that must be paid in full in the year in which they are accrued, even though we get value from them over time. Wages and salaries are seen as worse than other current expenses because they are seen as fixed costs that somehow can't be cut in downturns, even though layoffs are commonplace. Welcome to The Ripple Effect, the podcast that takes you on a journey through the minds of work and faculty. I'm your host, Dan Loney, and in each episode, we'll be diving deep into the inspiration behind the groundbreaking research that Wharton professors have conducted and exploring how their findings resonate with the world today. We'll be covering a diverse range of topics, bringing you the latest insights and knowledge that you can apply to your life and to work. So get ready to dive into new ideas with The Ripple Effect. Peter, great to have you here. It's great to see you again. Thanks for giving us a few moments today. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so this idea of financial accounting, when do you think it really has has kind of started and, and kind of gained traction so that you're seeing this impact around companies right now? You know, one of the things that my father told me I should absolutely do is take accounting classes, and I never did. Uh, so my knowledge of accounting is very much as a kind of outsider on this stuff. Uh, but I think there was a coming together of a couple of trends. So financial accounting, my understanding of this, modern financial accounting begins with the Great Depression, the creation of the Security Exchange Commission, efforts to kind of standardize uh, how financial accounting is done because, you know, if accounting is not consistent, it's pretty useless, right? Uh, and that uh, has been in place for a while. The Financial Accounting Standards Board was created, I think, 1973 or so, and they began to coordinate and consolidate the rules into clearer categories so they could be used. And then again in 2009, another effort in that. So the standards, the basic ideas of this are not new. Uh, they got started at a time when, in most companies, the big deal was capital equipment. It was machinery, even yeah. manufacturing especially, right? So not too surprising that they focused on that, and they didn't pay much attention to human capital. And the key distinction that they made was that something could be an asset if you own it, and then you could invest in it, but only if you own it. So once they thought about human capital, and they were not, to my knowledge, thinking about it at the time this was all promulgated, you know, you don't own your employees, so they can't be assets, and you can't invest in them because you can only invest in assets. So that's been around for a long time. What begins to change is in the 1980s, the rise of shareholder value as the new goal for companies. They used to say that uh, the goal of companies was explicitly to balance the interests of the stakeholders. And investors were one, but so were employees, and so was the community around you, and so were your customers. When I first got to the Wharton School, that is how people thought about it right. and how we taught it. There was an academic revolution on that question that pushed sort of from the economics point of view, the idea that really shareholders are the only stakeholder. And it was one of those battles that was one without a fight because we didn't actually teach corporate governance here or in most places. So as it advanced and finance became more important, as investors became more important, and some of that happened when we started to get bigger institutional investors. You know, groups like CalPERS, the California Pension Fund, mutual funds like Vanguard and Fidelity, these are now huge investment blocks. Yeah. And particularly when they're buying the market average, right? The idea that in the past is if they didn't like the way you were running their company, they just dump the stock and move on. Sure. You can't do that if you're trying to buy the market average. So, you know, a, another development was this idea that the investors were pushing for this shareholder value goal. So once you had that, we had financial accounting already, which drew this distinction between human and physical assets. There were no human assets, right? Human 
um, capital broadly defined. And then uh, the idea that shareholder value was really the big goal, and then institutional investors pushing that goal harder and harder all the time. Now we start to see some things change, and especially now that we start to see so many companies where the real value seems to be the people. Yeah. And so those initial assumptions from you know, the 1930s that people are not assets and they have no real value in the finances of a company now starts to really bite because you have so many companies where the physical assets don't matter and where investors are pushing harder on financial accounting outcomes because... You know, investors are not trying to maximize current profits. Investors are trying to make money on future profits. Right. The value of the shares is what will things look like in the future. Whether you're profitable today or not doesn't matter so much to them. So now we have to start thinking about what the rules of the game look like. And like in sports, if you wanted to know how good a basketball team was, you'd have to kind of begin by understanding the game, which means understanding the rules on which it is played. And financial accounting sets out the rules on which companies are operating and what they're trying to do. And those rules are financial accounting. And because of the quirks of the way it handles or doesn't handle human capital, we start to see bigger and bigger problems as human capital becomes, in objective terms, more important, but in financial terms, still worthless. Uh, and shareholder value, based on financial accounting terms, becomes the issue. So then, with this shift, especially in the last few years, then the impact on the company and the employee ends up being a pattern where you obviously don't want to see you go down this pattern because, as you and I have talked in a variety of different fronts in the past, the value of the employee really has a significant strength towards the company's you know, bottom line benefit. Yeah, and a lot of our colleagues in strategy uh, recognize that certainly the biggest uh, benefit you've got, the biggest competency comes from the people and the way you manage them. Right. And we have so many companies, like in the tech world, where physical equipment doesn't matter at all. Right. It's all about intellectual horsepower and the ability to execute things. Um, all those things are really kind of what matter. And uh, the investors have gotten onto this issue before anybody else. And their problem with financial accounting is they can't tell uh, how valuable companies are because they can't learn anything about its human capital because nothing about it is reported except for the total number of employees you have, but not the total number of workers. So we'll come back to that issue in a minute here, yeah. right? Uh, and it leads to all kinds of distortions, as in any situation where you measure only a few things and you leave out some important ones, you're going to get strange outcomes, and that's yeah. what we get. How then do you think this this shift then potentially impacts how companies think about things like hiring and and where you know the the level of employee involvement that they have within companies? Yeah, so let's start with maybe the simplest one. Let's talk about layoffs, um, which, if you think about it, let's say our employees had asset value. If you leave the U.S. Um, accounting standards are different, and some of those accounting standards do allow employees to be assets. So let's say we thought employees were assets and had assets, and we announced we're going to have a layoff. And what layoffs meant is we're just going to take those assets and we're going to push them out the door. You'd say that we're crazy. Right. It's like, okay, we got a bunch of computers here. We're going to give them away. We're just pushing them out the door. It wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. And we see something like this. If you see what's going on right now in the tech industry especially, but elsewhere, you see companies that struggled like crazy to fill those positions and get people and hold on to them, and now they're dumping them. And there's a pretty good bet that in six months they'll be trying to get new employees back. And in the current context, unlike you know the 1970s and before, employees are not hanging around expecting to be rehired. So right. you got to go back in and hire people, right? So that's maybe the most obvious strange example. When you come to hiring, you know, the thing that employers measure in hiring is they measure the cost per 
higher. Perfectly sensible thing to do. The reason they measure that is those costs are ones that show up at least aggregated inside your financial accounting. And the other thing they worry about is cost, uh, sorry, time to fill a vacancy. Those two things, okay? Right. Perfectly reasonable. What they don't measure is the quality of the hire, which, if you think about it, is exactly what you would think they would be looking at, is how good are the people we're hiring. You know, you could hire lousy people cheaply, yeah. right? But if you look at what is reported in accounting and the things that aggregate up, that's your incentive. Uh, Hire cheaply. uh, Don't worry about whether they're any good or not, right? I mean, it seems crazy, but that is literally what companies are doing. The evidence on this is pretty overwhelming. At least three different surveys show that employers are not trying to assess the quality of the people they hire. Uh, And they see them as kind of interchangeable. So, you know, one of the things that most all of us know is when you bring in somebody from outside, it takes a while for them to become productive compared to the people who are already there. There's no accounting for that. I mean, there's no literal accounting and there's no understanding of that either. So we're starting to see investors care about this a lot, particularly when they look at these tech firms, again, because they can't figure out what the value is and they would really like to know. So take us into the, the, the structure of doing a book about this, uh, your book, Our Least Important Asset. What was it that you have seen play out that have, has really driven you to need to do a book about this topic right now? Yeah, well, you know, I think most people who are honest and kind of curious will say that the book never turns out to be what you thought it was going to. And you probably know this about writing, even writing papers. You don't write the introduction until the thing is done, yeah. uh, nor the conclusion, because you don't really know what it's going to say. So I started out thinking I was going to write a book about how we actually manage employees. And uh, that's different from what textbooks say. Like if you look at a textbook, they'll talk about you know, the issue of hiring, for example, how you craft a job description and then you post a job ad and then you see who applies and then you do these assessment tests and all this stuff, right? None of that really happens, yeah. you know, or rarely. So the evidence from the census indicates the average person, at least a couple of years ago when they asked this question, reported that when they changed jobs, they were not looking for a job and they didn't really see a job ad. Somebody came and got them. We don't do any of those fancy testing of employees. We typically just rely on unstructured interviews, which are pretty terrible as a way to hire, especially when we get rid of recruiters uh, because they're expensive, and we just push the task off onto line managers Mm -hmm. who aren't trained for this and they don't know what they're doing, right? So I started to look at practices by practice to see how we were actually doing on these things, and it all seemed pretty lousy. (laughs) <laughs> you know, in ways that just wouldn't make sense to any of us if we knew just a little bit about how employees actually operate. So then I started to say, why are they doing this? Why do you see the same pattern everywhere? And a simple description of this is it's the British phrase, penny wise and pound foolish, right? right. So that is they're squeezing costs on some costs, and they're completely ignoring other costs. Uh, Why is that? And then I started to think about and look around to see what was driving this behavior. And, you know, the usual view we hear about shareholder values is they're just trying to maximize profits, so they're not paying attention, you know, to, to anything on the cost side. But that's not true. And part of the problem is we were kind of misled about what companies do by are introductory economics classes, which tell us that companies, by definition, are maximizing profits. Okay, what's a profit? You just look at your revenue, and you look at your uh, costs, and you subtract them, and that's your profit. Well, that's not true at all. Uh, Anybody who sits down next to an accountant for a while will get a half-hour lecture (laughs) as an introduction as to why that stuff is not so obvious. It's like thinking the game of basketball is simply about stuffing the ball in the hoop uh, and stopping other people from doing it. And you would think, well, let's just tackle people, which, you know, does seem to happen in the NBA sometimes. Sometimes. And let's just get a really huge guy, stand under the basket and pop the ball. You know, you play it differently once you understand the rules, right? And so I ended up sort of getting a sense of what the rules were. Big part of it are these financial accounting things. There is another part, and that is important part because of the importance of investors and that shareholder perspective, uh, the people who get to run companies now are different in systematic ways 
than they were a generation or two ago. Right. They're much more likely to be engineers who come to these tasks with uh, assumptions about human behavior, but also goals about optimization. Uh, the data science world has given them lots of tools to optimize, but optimize, you got to optimize on something, and generally they optimize on minimizing the number of employees and employment costs. So that's what they end up driving. Uh, and they haven't had as much management training. Most companies, corporations, got rid of that. It used to be that you'd get hired, you'd be put into a management training program where they taught you all this stuff about managing people, basically. Right, right. And those are gone. So we have a lot more CEOs, famous ones in the tech world, um, who never managed anything, really. Um, they are engineers for the most part. Um, and, you know, their view about people was that they were not particularly important. Right? So that that component uh, of uh, of the investor in this process, uh, we've obviously seen in, in the last few years how – the investor and the employee have more of a voice in the in what's going on in the company these days. Do they have enough impact where they're able to affect change on on a topic like this, on an issue like this, on on, on that element of financial accounting? Yeah. So the investors, you would think, have the big hammer, right? right. Because they're driving what uh, executives are doing. Um, the accounting world, and this is, you know, as an outsider to it, but at least listening to our colleagues who are deep into this, the accounting world is astonishingly conservative. It is run, for the most part, by um, associations of accountants, and the Financial Accounting Standards Board uh, sets the rules for accounting. They are overseen by another board, which is not elected. It's sort of that industry of financial accounting. Uh, but not finance, just right. financial accounting, right? The Security Exchange Community or, or Security Exchange Commission has delegated the task of creating those rules to the Financial Accounting Standards Board, and they haven't been particularly concerned about what those rules do to the operation of companies. Right. And they have been concerned about being consistent. And the idea of valuing human capital is something that's kind of off the charts for them. It seems so weird. Right. So the investors have been pushing for a while to try to get more from uh, companies on this in terms of reporting. They've been pushing Security Exchange Commission hard on this. They haven't gotten very far yet. So the little bit they got is in 2021, the Security Exchange Commission required that companies report anything they thought was material about human capital, their human capital, to their business. But they get to pick what that is. Right. And they get to pick what they report. And so what most of them report is just verbiage about their principles. So it's worthless if you're an investor. You don't learn anything from it. So these investor groups are big, and they still aren't getting very far, which shows you that this world of accounting standards is remarkably insular. Uh, and I think everybody who looks at that is struck by it, and lots of people have thought about it. So um, the investors can't make much headway on this, at least not yet. The employees have very little power. The only power employees ever really have is if a lot of them are quitting. Right. Uh, a lot of them were quitting. That might be slowing down a bit now. I'd say the employers have largely resisted efforts to do uh, make the changes that employees want. So, right. for example... There's a big concern now about mental health in the workplace. Many employers are responding to that, which is a nice thing. But what they're responding to is helping you deal with the stress that we have created for you. Right. <laughs> they're, not, they're not trying to deal with the stress per se. Uh, as we know, wages are lagging inflation by a lot. Yeah. So it's not that uh, employers are willing to up wages enough to maybe clear the labor market for them. Um, and one of the reasons for that, again, is that what investors see are the wage and salary costs. That's a bad thing. They really don't like those yeah. because those uh, look to them like fixed costs, even though they're not fixed. Historically, they were more fixed. And in economics, we treated them as if they were fixed. That is, they couldn't go down in a downturn in the business, but of course they can. And one more thing which is particularly quirky is the Security Exchange Commission requires that you report headcount, which is the number of employees 
not the number of workers. Okay. So if you bring in contractors, that doesn't count. Yeah. So if you'd like to make your revenue per employee or profit per employee jump up, yeah. drop some of your employees and bring in non-employees to do that work, the denominator falls, suddenly you look wildly more uh, productive and efficient and valuable. So that's another one of the quirks of this financial accounting. Well, and I would think as well that when you talk about the successes and failures that employees and managers have, that that obviously has to factor into this as well, because the accountants are looking at the bottom line. If you have projects that fail, that's going to end up hurting your bottom line. And then that's going to have a downstream impact on who managers are, how many managers there are, how many employees there are. It's, it's, it is, as the title of our podcast is, there is a ripple effect that plays out here. Yeah, I think the investors would love to see that. Uh, the companies don't want to show them anything about their internal accounting. Right. You know, how are our projects doing? What is our turnover of employees? By the way, this is what uh, the proposals, the new employees, uh, sorry, the new proposals driven by investors and our accounting colleagues uh, Dan Taylor here in our accounting department is one of those people, is asking for the same thing I was suggesting in independently, and that is let's ask companies to report turnover. Let's ask them to report how much they spend on training. Investors can't see that. Right now, training doesn't count as any kind of investment because, remember, you can't invest in things that aren't assets. Your employees sure. aren't assets, so you can't do that. So I think you know there are pressures on um, to improve this, but the resistance is so big so far, not much is happening. How You mentioned a moment ago about uh, the C-suite uh, level uh, impact. Uh, how then does that impact the longer-term decision process at the C-suite when you have people that are in those roles that aren't really the ones that have made those type of decisions in the past? Yeah, I think that's uh, that is a big issue, and you know, CEOs in particular have a really difficult job, and they can't know everything, and they need people around them who can point out those things. You yeah. know, that you're supposed to know. They're not experts on marketing. They're not experts, certainly, on human resources. Very few anybody comes through that track and gets to the top, right? Yeah. So somebody has to kind of point this stuff out to them and make the arguments to them. That hasn't been happening. Uh, I think over the last, well, since the 1980s, basically the pressure has been on human resources to cut. Right. Uh, because that's what improves the company's financial accounting outcomes. Uh, and, you know, making an argument about uh, why we really need to invest employees gets nowhere. Yeah. We're in a slightly different moment now because now there are enough concerns about employees some of these under the ESG umbrella, you know, yeah. social impact. Yeah. You should be nice to your employees. Uh, some of it because, frankly, they're quitting, and quitting is super important, even though in financial accounting it doesn't show up anywhere. But as a CEO, you can't miss the fact that a lot of your people are quitting, yeah. and especially people close to you, right? So I think the, you know, again, I think the pressure is on to do something about this, but the CEOs themselves... Uh, don't really understand a lot of this stuff. Sure. They don't understand what the costs are of turnover. Um, most companies don't know. It's a little hard to figure this stuff out. Most of them are not trying. I think the human resource people understood that nobody really wanted to hear this stuff, and they didn't want to get up on a soapbox and make the case. Uh, now it's easier to do, right? Once you see that your positions are vacant and you're not getting things done, yeah. it's a little hard to... Um, you know, it's a little hard to miss that. There is one place where I think we are seeing particularly quirky decisions, I think, by employers and the C-suite things. And this is back to this optimization goal. There are a lot of things that we have studied for a long time and lots of evidence for that show that engaging employees in some decisions makes much better outcomes. Sure. They know things that are useful in the decision, and they also care about it and are more invested in it when they do it themselves. A lot of that, a lot of those practices are going away and being replaced by software. So here's an example. Sure, yeah. Let's set our work schedules. We have 10 employees in my office. The work has to be covered. The office has to be covered, but people always have emergencies, and many of them have life concerns that they would like us to accommodate in some way. Well, there's a couple of ways you could do that. 
One of the ways which has worked extremely well is something just called flex time. And flex time means that the employees get together and they work it out. And they say, okay, Dan's going to do this on Monday. He's got to come in a little late, uh, but I can cover that if he will cover this later. It it takes a little while to get good at this, but it doesn't take long. And it's quite flexible, right? The other way you could do it is you could delegate it to software. Uh, And software will make sure that everybody has exactly the same number of hours, everybody is treated equally, but there's no flexibility in that, and employees don't like it because they have no say. Why would you go with software when you could do this with employees and it's much simpler in the long run? Well, uh, because we want to be optimal. Uh, And getting employees to do this, I don't know how to do that, Uh, work with employees, so I'd like to just turn this over to software and let them do it. So we get a yeah. worst solution, which is more expensive, but it seems to fit this goal of optimization. Right? So we're seeing several of those situations play out in the workplace now. Peter, great to talk with you. Good luck with the book. The book is titled Our Least Important Asset. Peter Capelli of the Wharton School, thanks very much for coming in. Good. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for listening to The Ripple Effect. We hope you found this episode informative and engaging. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review so that we can continue to bring you the best insight from the Wharton School.